We always nice catch you at the worst time, Paul. <laughs> yeah. And every time I feel bad about preying on the, the weak and, we and the vulnerable. <laughs> and I always jump at the opportunity. Hey, welcome to Beer Christianity. My name's John T. I'm Laura. I'm Malky. And this is Paul. Say hello, Paul. Hello. Hello, everybody. Thank you for having me on. Paul is, uh, I think we described you previously as the big dog from Greenbelt. Is that right? Mm. Yeah, we did. So still the official title, yeah? Totally, yeah. <laughs> Paul's yeah. The, the big dog from Greenbelt Festival, uh, the best festival in the world, I think definitely in the UK. And it's coming up very soon. So we're going to be talking to Paul about that, about um, what you can expect from Greenbelt. Uh, we're going to be answering some of the questions listeners have sent in via Instagram. And we will also be talking about the kind of the Greenbelt vibe, the Greenbelt person, um, and the idea of deconstructing and reconstructing and all that kind of stuff. So we'll hopefully cover all of that. But you know how it goes. Once we start drinking, it could go in any direction, really. So, um <laughs> Yeah. Um, Paul, how is planning for Greenbelt 2024 going? Oh, hell, wait, no, wait, wait, wait. Also, this is the 100th. <laughs> we just talked about this literally 30 <laughs> seconds ago, and I immediately forgot it. This is the 100th episode of Beer Christianity, which I think... Hey. Yeah, I think that deserves raising a toast. So I'm raising an actual flute of Look at Prosecco. That, that yeah, is an actual I, uh, flute. <laughs> I'm very, wow. very much enjoying it. Um, <laughs> so cheers, beer, beer Christianity. And thanks to everybody who uh, is with us now and who was with us at the beginning as well, because, gosh, the stamina of some people is just incredible. Yeah. So, well done. Cheers, well done for getting girl. through. Mm. Well done, you. What are we all drinking, by the way? We might as well do this now, because otherwise we mm. forget until right at the end. Um, we do. Paul, what Whenever are you drinking? Finish their drinks. Yeah, I'm drinking a Merlot uh, from the Lidl that's just up the road from me. And um, it's, it's very, very nice. Thank you. Nice. Love it. Melks, what's you on? Uh, Moretti. It's a beer. <laughs> and it's got, it even says Bira Moretti. And nice. I don't speak fluent Italian, but I think that means Moretti beer. <laughs> uh. <laughs> Ah, a student of the Romance languages. <laughs> a very appropriate drink for um, this uh, well, this podcast, really. Like, you're the only one on theme. Yeah, Which often true. Does, doesn't happen, but it feels like for our 100th episode, we should... Somebody should well, be drinking like, beer. Somebody should be drinking beer. <laughs> or just yeah. beer. I was like, what's our Italian theme? <laughs> no, just, just beer. <laughs> yeah. We're talking about our Roman Empire. Yeah, the Christianity. <laughs> <laughs> Laura, what are you drinking? I'm drinking Thatchers from a can. Nice. Just the same level of classes. Uh, same level me, of class. which I think is... I've yeah maintained well, same level of class I've maintained. I think across the <laughs> the show, really. I'm I'm kind of crossing over because I've got Conegliano Prosecco, also Superior, Italian, also on Brut. theme, <laughs> also Italian. So this is the Italian themed episode, and I think hopefully Mama we would have picked up on that. And... <laughs> Mamma mia. <laughs> Actually, I knew a missionary who had served in Italy for about 20 years, and he unironically said Mamma Mia all the time. It was amazing, and I love it. Marco, if you're listening, hi. Um, uh, <laughs> I was anyway. going to generally ask if that's who that was, but then you just yeah. fully name-dropped him. <laughs> Definitely him. We love we love Mark. He's he's a legend. Um, yeah, I'm drinking Prosecco, but I have backup cider to uh, cross over with you too, Laura, so... It's all good. Anyway, welcome to the 100th episode of Beer Christianity. It's been a wild ride. And I think we started this primarily because we wanted to talk about Greenbelt. So we thought it was appropriate that, and I remember having the conversation with Laura and saying we should really talk about this and we should record it. And we went to Broadway's public house in Didcot and recorded our first um, thing. I don't think we ended up publishing it first, but it was the first thing we recorded mm. and we did it in, uh, yeah, in Broadway's pub. Um, and It was my first Greenbelt as well. It was oh, the first yeah, time I ever looked at Greenbelt and I only went for the day. And yeah, and we saw Russell Brand. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's aged well. That's good. <laughs> this is I, not a visual podcast, but the look on Paul's face. <laughs> I I maintain that he was great there. Uh, it's unfortunate there. what's happened since it's, then yeah. and what we've learned about him since then. Yeah, then. <laughs> it's a damn shame. I mean, so, at this point, he's more likely to turn up at Keswick. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, or the riots. You know. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I feel like that's mm. also a more <laughs> likely thing. Um, 
uh, <laughs> Paul, I think to start off kind of easy, since we that was quite hard, which of the guests at Greenbelt 20... I didn't mean Greenbelt to bring up 20... Russell Brand so early, sorry. <laughs> no, that's okay. Which of the guests at Greenbelt 2024 do you think is most likely to be cancelled in the next two years? I think that's... No, you don't know that. <laughs> um, tell us what we could expect from Greenbelt 2024. <laughs> well, um, yeah, I'm feeling like really youthful here because we're, we've only done 50 editions and, and you've done 100. So oh, like you're, babies. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm just an infant <laughs> dang, dangling on, on the knees of your uh, your wisdom and maturity. Arguably, um, your thing takes more work. This uh -huh. one. <laughs> Arguably. 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 Arguably, yes, yes. <laughs> Uh, well, you can expect the same heady mix of um, music, theatre, a little bit of comedy, not as much comedy this year. It's funny how when you're in the middle of it, you don't see things quite emerging. And then I looked at things the other day and I thought, cool, we haven't booked much comedy. And then I thought, oh, that's because we were spending so much time on developing a visual arts programme. Um, and we put loads of effort into doing much more visual arts this year. And so these things sort of ebb and flow and they they stretch and they wane and they wax or whatever whatever words other words you can think for that <laughs> getting bigger and smaller thing um but all of these things um you know the the three stranded dna of greenbelt as you will know is artistry activism and belief and music worship and spirituality workshops um a youth program uh, or everything that that sort of like can can be vaguely construed as fitting within that three-stranded helix um, will be there. So everything from uh, Corin Bailey Ray is coming to play her whole new album in its entirety, which is called Black Rainbows. Which, if you're not if you've not heard of it, is a is an absolute piece of work. And I mean that not in the ironic sense. I mean that in the it is a beautiful, beautiful piece of work. It's been Mercury nom nominated and quite rightly so. And so I'm really excited about that. It's really nice because Corinne, not, she didn't grow up coming to the festival. That's, that's spinning it a little bit, but she did come to the festival as a young person um, from a Christian youth group in Leeds. And uh, she played in 2005 as a newly emergent um, darling of six music as it was then. Uh, just well six music had begun a little while but it wasn't that old and um so yeah it, it's going to be really wonderful to see her back with what what i think is her best and certainly her most interesting album um but you know as you guys know it's it's way more it's not like just a, a festival with a main stage and a music bill there's workshops there are conversations uh, there are different spaces where all sorts of things are being prodded and investigated and um really it's difficult to know where to begin but that was a very inadequate rambling start to answering your start. question a very good start you feel like you've encapsulated the festival so well and i mean yeah i know one of the people we're really excited about is um in the new venue that i think you've got for this year which is the no fly fly zone and we're particularly i think excited for richard raw which is yep. a pretty good bag <laughs> yeah no well thank you for mentioning him uh yeah, we're really, really pleased. Richard hasn't been able to come to the festival since 2005. And many of you will know that he's not in the best of health. He doesn't travel really much, if anything, anymore. Um, and so for him to agree to say, yes, I'm going to come live to the festival via, uh, you know, like a, an internet link is is really brilliant. Tomorrow we're doing an email out to crowdsource some questions. You know, if you had one question to ask Richard Raw, Raw what would it be? Um, Martin Rowe is going to host that session for us. And yeah, we're really looking forward, really looking forward to that because I think there are a few writers, thinkers, speakers, activists who've been really sort of like a shaping influence on Greenbelt and its spirituality and its direction and the things that it values and the vision that it holds. And, and definitely Richard Raw is one of those people, you know, where we are a little bit slippery. I will grant you that we don't nail our colors to a mask. There's no piece of paper on the Wittenberg door, but there are certain key characters. And that if you trace them and if you put them together in some sort of family tree, you would recognize the children. And one of the children is Greenbelt, I think. And Richard Raw is one of our forefathers, I guess, in that sense. In, very, in a very patriarchal sense. Absolutely. And um, so exciting. And where would you put Brian McLaren, who will also be at the festival, 
in the kind of Greenbelt family, if not tree, then um, family group chat. Where 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 is where is Brian McLaren? He's definitely part of the group chat. Um, he's not the same as Richard Raw. There are similarities, uh, absolutely. Uh, not just both are bold, and that's something that I. Uh, you know, follow uh, avidly in their footsteps <laughs> in that respect. Um, but I think Brian's more of um, oh, what would I call him? He's more of a popular communicator. And I, by the when I use the word popular, there I don't mean it in any way disparagingly. I actually mean it as a as a compliment. I think that what Brian does is you can put Brian into any conversation with anybody an economist, a politician, a philosopher, and he will always bring something really interesting to the table. What I like about him, and it's the same with Richard, although Richard is very, very beautifully and wonderfully Franciscan. He's deeply theological. And I think that's part of what Greenbelt finds so attractive about him is that we crave that sort of authentic spirituality and that, that sort of authentic spiritual leadership. I mean, leadership's got such a bad rap, but I think that very few of us would have many qualms about sort of naming Richard as a as a leader in that sense uh, and as a pastor in a sense. But I think Brian's slightly different because he's like, um, well, I don't know, I'm I'm making all this up. He's like um, he's like a thought provoker. I was saying to someone else, uh, we, we've got a. We've got a thing whereby we've lost a key panelist from a wonderful conversation that we've got lined up at the festival where we we're using the Aaron Datty Roy um, phrase, you know, another world is not only possible on a quiet day, I can even hear her breathing. And we've got together four really interesting uh, speakers and artists from across the festival to give us their sense of what can they hear on a quiet day? What is the future they can hear breathing? Now, one of the key guests who was lined up to be part of that can't do it anymore, can't come to the festival. So we we're having a conversation and someone said, Brian McLaren could do that. And I thought, yes, he absolutely, absolutely could do that. So I guess what I mean by Brian is that he's just got this way of he's done the work. Um, so Richard Raw has done the work by living, by living the practice, by living the rhythm of being a Franciscan. I think that uh, Brian has done the work by by reading and thinking and having been an English teacher in his first vocation. I think he's just got this knack of, I'm going on, uh, for communication, which is really beautiful. Uh, someone once told me that if you, if you can express something simply, it means that you understand it profoundly. And I think that that, for me, is one of Brian's greatest gifts, coupled with the fact, to return to your question, John T., he sort of describes the arc of the journey that many Greenbelters have found themselves on, where they found themselves falling out of the back end of some form of evangelical first love and first faith, and that completely disintegrating around them, either they deconstructing it in themselves or having it painfully deconstructed by external circumstances, and then having to live through some form of period of disenchantment, uh, but then hopefully finding their way through to sort of like a second naivety and a second, uh, like a falling back in love again. And I think that Brian has been the, the perfect companion to to write and to walk that journey with with hundreds of green belters. That was yeah, he, answer. he see, that's a great answer because he does seem to be a... Uh, a person who really beautifully articulates that deconstruction experience, not just the journey, but just people who are having the questions who who maybe wouldn't even identify with that movement. When they encounter Brian McLaren, they, they tend to find articulation and a sense of um, uh, purpose or direction in in that feeling. While, while I think when people encounter Richard Raw, they find a sense of almost comfort and safety and and a and a depth of spirituality in it which i think just helps you feel like you're not abandoning your faith which is um the 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 deconstruction journey um i i personally think there's something in greenbelt that that feels like um that arundhati raw Roy, Roar, Aaron Dutty, Roar. You heard it here first. We are shipping them. The <laughs> the Roy thing of um, 
what you can you you can almost hear it and and i feel like we're we're hearing a a reconstructing christianity a reconstructing faith in jesus what whatever people are comfortable with calling it but people going through the deconstruction and not not being so disillusioned that they abandon everything um even even those of us who i think are at this point automatically irritated by by conservative christianity even when it's not doing anything wrong um there's a there's a sense among a lot of people that that i encounter that they're they're keen to to rebuild something better rather than move on to a, an absence or a defining against i mean is that something that you felt over the years at greenbelt and cuz cuz to me greenbelt is part of that it's where it's where you start hearing that happen yeah i i really hope so i would really I would really regret it if Greenbelt was just like a space where disillusioned people just got together to slag off um, what wasn't working. Um, and I think we've always, in our own communications, in the way that we've talked about ourselves and positioned ourselves, if you want to use some marketing speak, we've been careful, as far as we're able, sometimes it's really hard, I have to say, not to diss the church because... At the end of the day, if it wasn't for the church, if it wasn't for the community of Christ in all of its various hues, um, Greenbelt wouldn't be here. Um, and in a sense, we're part of that body. We're absolutely, I would want to count ourselves as part of that body. Um, but I, I, I think you're right. We, we don't want to be, we are part of the body that welcomes people who are disenfranchised, who are refugees from those the institutional forms of that, that body. But... I think there's no, there's nothing to be gained from just all sitting around slagging everything off. And well, because it's really lonely. There's no few, There's no way forward with that. I mean, if we're all just going to do our own thing and and just give up on it, that's okay. But why come to Greenbelt? Just give up on it. Bye. I think that the people who come to Greenbelt are trying, and even if they can't talk about it or have conversations about it or they don't know, that's why they're coming instinctively spiritually they're coming because they still want to be part of remaking something that is communitarian as well as as individual and i think um we see that every year in in how the communion service is such a focus and i remember i think the first year i went john t took me along to the goth eucharist <laughs> like there's still a lot of very Christian, and the way you talked about um, Richard Rohr's kind of um, uh, rooting and foundation in in tradition, um, I think Greenbelt still does that. It's not just a a mad bunch of anarchists, although it very much is that. <laughs> um, what shape is uh, communion going to take this year? What what kind of differences is there going to be? Um, it's deliberately very very stripped back and very simple this year, and in the hope that we aren't don't come across as being crass it's going to is the theme of it is dreaming of home and it's very simply going to be based around bread and the sharing of bread and we're going to do something different different with the way that that bread is distributed and shared and we're very much going to have a focus on gaza and um palestine more widely um we're hoping Although I've just had a call today, um, which is very distressing to have Dawood Nassar with us, who is part of the Nassar family who live and work at the Tent of Nations, which is a hilltop farm just outside of Bethlehem, surrounded by illegal settlements. We're hoping that he will be a key guest and speaker as part of the service. And uh, the liturgy will, and our prayers will, will very much um, be focused on remembering the people of Gaza. Uh, but it would be a very simple service. There's no no bells and whistles, really. There's no stunts or anything. We will. We at one point we're going to try and live link to um, the community that live at the Tent of Nations with hopefully Dawood in the field on the stage. Um, but yeah, it's it's going to be very very simple. I th I'm I think it's going to be very powerful. Um, but it's it's probably the simplest communion service we've ever devised. But I think I feel quite comfortable and excited about it that sounds wonderful i also am particularly excited to hear siskin green who i believe are playing 
um, adjacent to that or, or in communion. Is that right? Yeah, they are leading the music for it. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. We love Siskin Green. We think they're incredible. I got to interview them recently and I mentioned to Laura, I was like, hey, I think you'll like these people. And she was like, I fucking love them. <laughs> yeah. So well, they're great. And they've been so, you know, like sometimes you choose the musicians to work with you on the communion and, and they're great and they provide the music. Siskin Green, like well over and above that, like not only yeah, we'll do the music. What about this? We could write this. Oh, what have you thought? You know, like so they've been. It's been amazing. They they're just so creative and passionate, and yeah, they're brilliant people. And for listeners who don't know Siskin Green, they're a Scottish folk trio, I believe, and they do a really great line in um, uh, reworking old amazing hymns that kind of remind you of how many of the old hymns are actually just as focused. They will often write them with um, uh, female pronouns for God. Uh, they sing songs written by John Bell about um, uh, female figures in the Bible and the women's experience. And, and it's just incredibly beautiful folk music, worship music, soulful. It's, it's stunning. It's, it's like, purity and goodness and it's so good i think so. their album is i think the only worship music that i've deliberately chosen to listen to in the last year <laughs> since i discovered <laughs> them at green belt last year they are i mean they're so my vibe but they are amazing and everyone should listen right. to them yeah. did i miss them last year they were on? there last year but i think they i i think they only played a small set last year i don't think they were they didn't do a big set so i was really excited to see that they're doing communion this year oh, very yeah. very cool they played really late have... on on the Sunday in the in the what was called the Orchard stage last year, which is like our second acoustic music stage. And, and um, those who were there absolutely, you know, loved it. Um, but this year um, they'll, they're going to play again. They're going to do the communion, but they're also going to do their own gig. And uh, yeah, they'll have a massive crowd this year, I'm sure. That's very cool. Okay, you were going to say something. Well, I was just going to say one. So I, about this time every year, <laughs> two days to the festival i start checking out the acts so that because they've, i've been at a few green belts where like afterwards or i catch the end of something or a friend sees something i guess it's just that festival thing you you can't see everything right um so I try and do my my homework um but somehow missed the trio that you were just referring to but i have found uh the dutty really not look to the band. google calendar that i've made malky because they are on our google calendar <laughs> there's a lot of things on that google calendar <laughs> yeah color coded <laughs> laura's very proud of the color coding in this google calendar <laughs> um, dutty moonshine big band yeah. and their opening track on their latest album is fuck off in g minor it's so and good I really like the sound that's of them. amazing it's so good. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're going to be. I'm not sure how Greenbelt will quite cope with them. I, I They are an amazing live act and like 14 piece, big brass section. Um, amazing. Um, they need to be on the Google calendar. What? I've not been adding this. Okay. <laughs> they do, the you know, at the risk of sounding very conservative, they do swear a lot. And um, what? <laughs> in booking them, I, I had lots of conversations with the agent about that. And did they ever tone it down? And would they ever tone it down? And I think they are going to try and tone it down, certainly between the songs. Um, but I think in terms of a party festival celebratory band, um, I, having seen them live, they're just, they're hard to equal. And uh, I, I think, I think, I just really wanted to put them in front of a green belt audience um, just because sometimes you just need to have a really, really good time. And I think that, you know, values wise, I think there's a lot to overlap between them and what they're about and, and what green belt is trying to do. Um, but there, there might be a few issues on the profanity. I'm, you know, we're getting the inbox, the email inbox is ready. It's, it's loins are girded. Do people complain about Brass Against? Because I love that, because they seem to come out going, ah, oh, it's a Christian festival, we're going to shock these people. And everybody just seemed to love it. Everyone was singing along with, fuck you, I won't do what you tell me. And I think they were just a little bit taken aback that everyone was so chill. Were they not chill with you? <laughs> Is that what I'm hearing? Uh, yeah, so that's a, that's a very good parallel to draw, Jonty. I would imagine a similar inbox after Dutty as we had for brass against um people in the field will be absolutely having a great time but there will be three or four or 10 or 20 people on the on the peripheries who will be uh just writing notes and getting very hot <laughs> under the collar it's so odd to like this anybody still people... cares about that 
I know. And I feel like we need to get people positive emails to your inbox on the Monday after inbox after yeah. after email to say that we love them. <laughs> yeah. I if you're it, sorry, go ahead. No, I I I I do I mean I'm I I Oh, yeah, I do sort of get it, like in terms of it being an open air main stage at an all age family festival. That said, you know, we are headlining them. We're putting them on at half nine. And I, I figure that once it's gone past nine, it, it, it's fair game. That's a, a recognizable watershed. And it's watershed. Yeah. That's the yeah. rule in my house yeah. anyway. Yeah. <laughs> if you're still up, fuck you. <laughs> I just yeah. I just I would challenge anybody who's not specifically homeschooling their children to find a kid at any festival who has not been hearing and using profanity on the daily for their entire school career. It's a, such an odd it's such an odd shibboleth to shibboleth. Yeah, that's really weird. Um, yeah. Okay. Aside from sweary music and all that kind of stuff. Oh, and I think um, Greenbelt uh, attendees who listen to this show should really try and fill the Greenbelt inbox with requests for more swearing. <laughs> Richard Raw was fine, but could he not have dropped an F bomb just for us? You know, that would be. <laughs> <laughs> I actually wanted to ask about um, something that you mentioned much, much earlier about the the visual arts. Can you tell us what that what What's different? What can we expect? Because that sounds very cool and very interesting. So yeah, um, building on the the workshop and the studio, which are two venues that we run for over sixteen year olds to really engage with uh, visual arts practitioner led workshops, which is something by and large, unless you're really into art, you leave behind after your school days. And I think that uh, adult green belters, if I can describe them like that, have really enjoyed those spaces over the last two or three years that we've done them. And every workshop has been massively oversubscribed. So we're continuing with those. But this year, what we've done, we've we've worked with a visual arts curator called Georgina Barney, who's a long term green belter, who's done some of those workshops. And she's pulled together a really, a really sort of like quite quirky quirky um, visual arts program that introduces a new venue called the residency which is going to see various artists in residence come in each day share their work lead workshops sometimes show films of their work do in conversation pieces those include um bobby baker uh if you know the work of bobby baker she is an absolutely wonderful british visual artist who's done incredibly fantastic feminist work since like the late 80s onwards she's fairly old now she's like the, the mother of uh, british visual arts really she was she was tracy emin way before tracy emin was tracy emin if you see what i mean she was uh, she's great and she's been to the festival twice before she's going to be in residence on the sunday um and she's done some great work she'll be talking about it we've got uh, an incredibly interesting provocative weird and wonderful artist in residence on the Friday called Lucy Wright. And she does this thing called hedge Morris dancing. And what she's, what she does in her practice is she tries to reclaim what are old English forms of folk art, which are pretty much predominantly male dominated. And she sort of like reappropriates them, reowns them, and says, Do you know what? You don't have to wear anything particular. You don't have to um you don't have to know anything too much to be part of this tradition. Let's just give it a go. Let's make some hankies and let's wave them about. Um, whether or not we look like we've been dragged through a hedge backwards, we're gonna be part of this tradition. And she's done some really interesting work and she will be leading workshops and then doing like a flash performance together with Mel Biggs, who plays the accordion, accordion for Fisherman's Friends, a bit of a name drop there. She Whoa. will be doing with with uh, Lucy Wright. So she's going to be on the Saturday, uh, on the Friday. Sorry, on the Saturday, we've got a whole range of stuff going on in the residency. But but the other thing that Georgina has done is she's created an art walk that will link the festival site to the main house at Bowton House, and each afternoon festival goers can do an art trail that will take them uh, through various art installations that are coming in some specifically commissioned and made for the festival a lot of work being shown for the first time that will connect the festival to the house and in the house itself we'll be using a beautiful room called the tapestry suite where georgina has curated an exhibition called performance wear where she's tapping into the northamptonshire tradition of being the center of shoemaking 
in the UK. And she's drawing links between Bowson House and its landed and privileged um, heritage and the way that it has been intricately involved on in a commercial basis with the shoemaking industry of Northamptonshire and Northampton in particular. And she's drawing links between sort of that historical thing, trying to do like the, what would you call it, the deconstructionist thing with that, but also think about the way in which we all wear stuff as performance and the way in which particularly in recent decades, trainers in particular so uh, you know like a modern form of shoe have become particularly associated with performative practice you know who you are is uh in some senses almost described by the trainers that you're wearing um so anyway that's that's a very inadequate sort of superficial thing to say that there's lots of little intrigue and stuff developmental stuff that we haven't done for years at greenbelt which i'm really excited that we're presenting and i hope that I hope that a few hundred green belters find their way into that sort of experience over the weekend. Sounds fascinating. I've also, you know, having worked for the Baptist Missionary Society and know that William Carey, the father of modern Protestant mission, comes from the Northamptonshire shoemaking industry oh. and was a cobbler himself. And there's a famous story about him throwing his wig away on the ship because it was becoming too much of a kind of source of pride. These these things, you know, I need to immediately create an installation for you. Just about, <laughs> I think you, you should do. write to the, to the BMS immediately and ask them, the beloved society and ask them to do something. <laughs> uh, that sounds incredible. Um, in in terms of the 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 festival itself, actually um, being able to exist and and all that kind of stuff, how how are we doing in terms of not just the numbers of people within the Green Belt audience going to see various things, but but sending missionaries like William Carey, but slightly better to their spouses, one hopes, um, uh, to get people into Greenbelt. Um, how's how's that going? Um, yeah, I mean, in in confessional mode, it's 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 really tough out there. It's really difficult um, to make an independent festival. Uh, you know, you will have read the press. I think there's between seventy five and a hundred festivals that have either called time. Yeah. this year and said this year as our last year or they've actually just cancelled ahead of delivering the event this year um the sums don't really stack up uh since brexit and then with covid um production costs have increased anywhere between 40 to 50 percent uh that they were in 2019 which is a bit eye-watering uh, we already feel like we're charging people more than feels comfortable for tickets um we've come up with this model whereby there are always affordable tickets for people who need and want them. And uh, there are more generous tickets for people who feel that they want to support the whole thing. That's great. But nevertheless, we feel like we're at the ceiling of what is possible to charge for a festival ticket. And yet um, we're still barely balancing the books. Um, it'd be great. You know, if we had four or 5,000 more people coming to the festival, then we would be into a different, sort of dynamic but we haven't and that's fine you know we are about a 10 12 000 people festival and it's in you know people will think what on earth are they spending their money on but uh on a you know a 2.2 million turnover budget you know our margins will come down this year to you know we we forecast that we might make i don't know a couple of um twenty thousand pounds surplus which we would then reinvest in next year as it happens we're not going to we're going to make a loss we know that already um but we're fortunate that we can bear that loss uh, certainly for this year but yeah it's not like a, a heartbreak story don't get the violins out but it's really as an economic model mm. um making a festival if you're independent and you don't have large sponsorship or pouring rights is bonkers absolutely bonkers doesn't work sorry what rights I like you know pouring rights if you have a big beer company uh, like beer christianity or, like us um, for instance that's yeah, what we should or Vera <laughs> Moretti or, uh, <laughs> uh, you don't um it's very yeah it's it's or, or you're not part of a large um, brand corporation like Fe um live Re festival republic or live nation then it it's difficult or yeah. big church no, that's not. <laughs> I think we were just discussing whether it would be okay to ask the question: is is that is that unfortunate and worrying, or is there no 
no real significant crossover between the audiences. And for listeners, uh, Big Church Festival has booked, has planned for next year to be on the same weekend as Greenbelt, which is also the um, bank holiday. But um, it is, it's unfortunate to have two Christian festivals happening on the on the same weekend. And so it just feels like a very weird decision from my perspective. I know you probably can't say that, Paul, but it just seems unfortunate. Yeah, it's an interesting one. Um, we've actually um, made very intentional and deliberate efforts to make connections and friendships with Big Church Festival over the last um, six, seven, eight years. And we've got to know Tim, who who runs it quite well. And we've got very open channels of communication. Um, yeah, we we found out that they were moving dates without being told um which is you know but and that that that's sort of fine do you know what i I hold it really lightly i think that we're so so different um in a way it almost might help um help what would it help what am i talking about there are undoubtedly people who go to both at the moment they go mm. to big church festival in may and they also come to greenbelt and that's wonderful that's to be celebrated i don't think there are that many i mean partly that would be quite an expensive thing to do. Um, yeah, true. So, you know, economically wise, you'd probably choose one or the other. Um, I'm not all that, I'm not all that troubled by it. I, I think it's slightly odd or awkward that they moved. There will have been very good and compelling reasons for them to have done that internally to make their own model work. But, you know, they have been part of, and we have tried to be part of like an ecology which broadly ex respects and accepts the other Christian events and stuff that are, that's, that are going on across the country. They're all very different, um, all wonderfully different, and they cater for different types of needs and audiences. And I think there's been like a, there's been quite a, I don't know, <laughs> uh, a status quo that's been quite helpful in terms, you know, different festivals being at different times and for different people, to types of uh, Christian. Um, but now we'll see. We'll see, you know, it'll, yeah, it's, it'll, it'll be the, the sheep and the goats. I mean, I know for one that I've been trying to convince my friends to live big church for years, and now I'm furious that my plans have been supported. Um, <laughs> but, yeah. um, never mind. Um, we've also had, I mean, speaking of one of those friends, um, I asked my friend Joshua, who I was having dinner with, if he had any questions, as well as the other listeners we asked about um, on our Instagram. So um, I'm going to start with those people's um, questions first, because um, Joshua is not coming to Greenbelt, and these people are. So <laughs> um, on our Instagram, we had uh, the Beaten Generation um, has asked, who was the act or, or guest at Greenbelt who's pleasantly surprised you over the years? Ooh, who was the act who's pleasantly surprised me? Oh, there's, there have been so many. <laughs> oh, now you put me on the spot. Who are you most expecting not to be pleased by and were pleased by? Let's let's intensify <laughs> the beaten generations question. Is it a good time to make another Russell Brand joke? Or... Yeah. <laughs> Oh, oh, they're oh dear me. There really are so many. I mean, I'm always astonished. Well, okay, so I'll, this is just really random, but I'm, you've put me on the spot. So Paula Gooder, who is um, a member of the, the, the team at St. Paul's Cathedral now, I think she's amazing. She's great. Um, she, what I loved about Paula in the early days of her doing occasional talks at Greenbelt where she would never push herself. She would never say, Hey, can I do this? She would just be there camping anyway with her family and thinking and writing astonishing stuff on the side. But if ever she was asked, she would step up and she would deliver something really clarion. And, and I'd think, Oh my word, that's great. She's so, she's so good. But the humility and the lightness with which she holds that and holds herself. So she would, she would perhaps be an example. And I have to say, I don't want to make a gender point, but I will. Um, you very rarely get men behaving like that. Um, yes, uh, the the men in the Greenbelt community are much more on the front foot when it comes to asking me, can they speak at Greenbelt, please? 
every single year. <laughs> so yeah, I'll just name Paula Gooder as a, a little example, perhaps, of someone who always surprises me in the sense that I think she's wonderful, um, but, but so understated. And good to shine a light on somebody who's not arrogantly just pushing their way forward, <laughs> which I'm sure none of the other people who've been asking you for sorts have been doing, so it's yeah. fine. Um, easier question for you this time is Jade has asked where the name comes from. So, Assuming you know the answer, it's an easier question. Yeah, it's slightly lost in the midst of time. And <laughs> then I've sort of developed my own spin on it in recent years. Um, so it's very, you know, it's firmly in the in the train of being a real oral tradition. But apparently in the early days of them uh, thinking about this first event, um, they were having to conjure the name. And apparently they were sitting in a caravan in a field on a farm and they thought we can't have anything too religious. We don't want anything that's like New Day or the, the Sunbreak, or you know, they they were trying to avoid those late sixties, early seventies type of um, posters that that you know, well, God Spell or um, anything with just, a T turned into a cross. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. So apparently, the rumor has, story has it someone shouted out "Green Belt" because at the time that was a a relatively new political geographical idea to do with planning and to do with holding, you know, green space open, certainly on the on the edges of urban development. And that's apparently, and they thought "Green Belt," yeah, that's good, but that's very open ended. You can load that with whatever meaning you need. It's not religious. Um, but it, 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 you can make of it what you will. So that's, uh, you know, like a lot of things, it, it's had a name that, that was just adopted and we've just stuck with it. I like the name Greenbelt for all those early reasons, but I like to think of it as, you know, those of us who have the privilege of, of um, working on Greenbelt, our job is to open up a space, is to hold up open a space in which things can happen. And I think that, that's being true to the idea of Greenbelt. Greenbelt is meant to be a space where um, normal urban commercial development doesn't happen, uh, but neither is it perhaps agricultural uh, rural land. It's somewhere in between. So, I mean, I like the idea of it being a particular space that's held open and that's in is in some sense protected. Um, so in my little head, that's the way I like to think of it. <laughs> It's not a karate thing. Then, then, then okay. That's good. That's no, fine. good to know. Like good one know. day it'll be black belt. Yeah, that's so, so. so good. <laughs> okay, so another ten thousand people coming. <laughs> it's it's black our belt. current our current chair of trustees is a black belt in some form of martial art. You know, there's so many martial cool. arts I can never remember the names of them, and <laughs> so I think she would be all up for it being called black belt. Yeah, amazing, yeah. love it. That's very cool. That's very cool. Um, and yeah, our question from Joshua, I think we, we, we should, we would be yeah remiss to mention that I think we're recording this a week after um, the worst of the riots uh, that were happening across the UK in the wake of the um, Southport killings. And um, yeah, it's, it, it was interesting that jo Joshua asks, how do we bridge the gap to those people who are involved in riots? And I think it was... We were talking about it at, at dinner, and I think it's really interesting that you've got Darren McGarvey um, here this year because I was just reading his book, and he he makes a really good point in there about, um, yeah, about how a lot of the kind of leftist circles that we work in aren't necessarily open to different to yeah but open to classist discussions, and how we need people to be willing to have conversations with people on the other side of the political spectrum in order to kind of yeah to you know to stop those stop people feeling like they have to write about these things you know to just name one of the reasons um so yeah how do we as green belt people bridge that gap uh that's a really good question tomorrow in our email dispatches we're going to include a link to um not just to your wonderful writing at Beer Christianity, uh, but to um, a substack by um, a green belter called Simon Cross, who has written a little bit about exactly what you're just asking, Laura. Um, he was a reporter in his earlier life, a journalist in Manchester covering some uh, riots. And he describes in this piece, like we can put, perhaps share the link with the, um, 
with the notes for this podcast, uh, the way that in which he had to follow the, you know, like a good journalist follows the story and following the story involves needing to listen to the people who are part of the story. Now, um, I'm not in the best place to answer this question myself today because I've been on the phone with a new partner that we have this year called Refugees at Home, and we've having to we've been having to reinvent their program for the table venue uh, with ten days to go to the festival because uh, a lot of the refugees and asylum seekers who they had been bringing to be part of their program to share their food and their culture in the venue are too scared uh, to travel, um, and so that's a huge shame, and I'm feeling the sort of the hurt and the loss of that. Um, today, but I think Joshua's question is entirely right. We cannot, um, we cannot afford not to listen um, to. You know, we may we may vehemently disagree with and uh, ha have you know huge, you know, physical aversion to. Um, the reasoning, the the narratives that fuel and shape that sort of behaviour, but I think we have to find ways of listening to what has led to it, as far as we're able. I'm saying that sitting in my very comfortable house in Cheltenham, um, but I think that Joshua was asking a really good question. Uh, it's, it's not going to go away. I mean, this was a particular expression and a particularly vile expression almost i mean i'm almost tempted to use the word evil uh, uh, in terms of its racism um you know abhorrent but in a wider sense structurally it it is symptomatic of um, a huge disease uh, a disease sorry which people are feeling that that we need to somehow pay attention to and work out whether there are any ways that we as a society can work to to heal that yeah, I think I think you're right. Like the the calling it evil and listening to the causes, I think may be more useful personally than listening to people who have already decided to take those causes and fall into fascism. I I don't I don't think we would have prevented the Holocaust by listening to Nazis more. Um, yeah, yeah. In you. fact, Nazis have only historically been defeated in one way. Um, and for me, I have I have little time for the the narrative of we really need to listen to these people once they've become Nazis. At that point, I don't think you are owed dialogue. Um, and I think absolutely listen to the concerns that people have about why they feel dis disenfranchised. Enfranchised? That's how upper class I am. Disenfranchised. Um, but but I think listening to people's scapegoating and giving it any kind of legitimacy because they happen to have been disenfranchised, I think plays into the hands of fascism. You're playing fair with people who will take that and murder you and your family. <laughs> so for me, I don't know, maybe that's not very Christian. I, that's a, a quite real possibility, but um, yeah. So no, Joshua, mm. I'm joking. I'm also Joshua's friend, so that's fine. <laughs> We're calling out Joshua. Um, <laughs> I think you're right to say, Laura, that I think that Darren McGarvey might have some interesting things to say about this uh, at Green Bar, and I'm really glad that we've got him this year, given, not least given everything that, that has happened this summer. So um, I think what we should probably also talk about is Flamey Grant, because yes. we're terribly excited about Flamey Grant. Um, and... Uh, how did you get hold of Flamey? Uh, what are your thoughts? Are you going to get letters? Um, what's what's the vibe? Um, I don't think we're going to get letters. Um, we we also um, got Flamey a gig at sort of like a, a festival that we're developing a partnership with in Holland called Graceland Festival. So Flamey is performing there this weekend and then Greenbelt the weekend afterwards, they have had an incredible backlash uh, uh, to, her, to her coming to be part of the program. The Netherlands is a really interesting country. On the one hand, it's really, really progressive. But in terms of its sort of like Christianity, it's, it's really, really quite conservative. 
<laughs> and Graceland yeah. are trying to do a green belt thing in the Netherlands, and it's quite difficult uh, for them. It's more difficult than for us. And anyway, so I don't think we're going to get a, a backlash. Um, basically, we got hold of um, Flamey's email um, via, who was it? I think it was our chair of trustees somehow, and just emailed uh, emailed her and uh, said, would you come to Greenbelt? And said, she said, um, I've been waiting for an invite. I heard lots of work at Greenbelt. I'll be there. I've already been invited to play at the Cambridge Folk Festival. So I'll be in Europe this summer. <laughs> That's where the conversation went. And so nice. we're really delighted. Uh, and Flamey will be doing quite a bunch of stuff across the weekend in slightly different guises. Um, you know, straightforward music performance, more theatrical review performance, She'll be in conversation um, as as her as her himself in the youth venue, talking about experience growing up in church in the States. Um, yeah, I think it's going to be great and um, utterly delightful, delightful to deal with um, in, in the build up. So I'm really looking forward to, to meeting them. Fantastic. I'm I'm super excited, I, Laura. I think the first thing we did when we decided when we were going is when is Flamey playing? We're not missing that. So. Literally, literally, this whole thing, the whole reason we're going. I think <laughs> I think there's going to be a massive crowd. I think there is. Yeah. Oh yeah. Going to be very very cool. I'm sure. We're going to get letters, and they're going to be from me. Thank you. <laughs> <Putting Flamey on. laughs> asking if you can ask Flamey to swear more. I think that's something. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, her review show that she's doing in the playhouse on Sunday, there was a bit of to and fro. She was asking, you know, what about language? And I said, in the playhouse, it's fine. It's a theatre. It's a closed venue. We just put an advisory on the show description. Mm. And I don't think they could quite believe it uh, at a Christian festival. I said, no, it's fine. It's fine. Come and, yeah. come and do it. It's fine. Yeah. Nice. That's very cool. Um, we've been th talking a lot about the... Um, the kind of need for these kinds of spaces. And we touched on it earlier about people who are reconstructing. Um, for people who are listening, who have only recently gone through a, a period of deconstruction or a moment of deconstruction, people who maybe had a lot of identity invested in, in things they are not sure about anymore. Um, you know, you're, you're the big dog of Greenbelt. Do you have any advice for them? Aside from come to Greenbelt, obviously. Come to Greenbelt, obviously. Um, yeah, I think that I would I would urge you to try and <clears throat> seek out communities or spaces a bit like Greenbelt. I'm bound to say that, aren't I? Whereby you can still be together with people because I think that the real tragedy of uh, the necessary phase, which most, if not all, people of faith go through um, phases, I would say, of various forms of deconstruction is that they cut themselves off from um, community uh, and from people who, despite everything, um, are still holding on to this, um, to, a, to a story, to a, a glint of truth that has actually made an incredible difference in their lives and which they don't want to jettison. They don't know quite how to hold on to it on your own that's really really difficult and so even if it's only two or three people i would just urge you to try and just stick together with at least two or three other people i think the the beauty of of green belt and i apologize for being selfish and talking about that is that it's sort of like it still provides that space for people who've fallen out of the back end of uh, institutional forms of perhaps early faith or second forms stages of faith to be surprisingly encouraged and nurtured and think, oh God, I miss this. Or, or, oh, I still, I really, this is me. This is, this is what I believe. I thought it was gone, but it is yeah. really there and I can't deny it. And I think that that's a beautiful thing and people should, I know it's really difficult to get over the hurdle of being there, but once you're there, it's like, you know, you, it's like that bit where in, in Anglican churches or high churches where they say, now let's share the peace and everyone goes around hugging each other and you're just not a hugger and you don't you don't want to go anywhere near that. You don't want to go anywhere near all that hugging malarkey, but you do want to be part of it. You want to be part of the communion. And 
I think that Greenbelt and there are other spaces, there will, there will always be people alongside you. I, don't, I just think just don't cut yourself off from other people. That's all I would say. That's very cool. Also, I've been fully paying attention because like I'm a, I'm a podcaster. Like, you know how people have producers in their ears. They can do multiple things at once. I'm just over apologizing for Googling something while we're talking. Paul is the creative director of Greenbelt. I know we're like, you know, big dog in that, but just big dog's a bit colloquial. Listeners might be like, oh, maybe he's just, you know, a large dog. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want people to be confused. <laughs> what I'm saying. Oh, thank you for saving the audience, Falky. That is, that is, you are doing God's work. Maybe wow. it's just a really. Can, can... For everybody who thought he was a big dog, he is in fact a human man. Well, maybe it's just a really With a job volunteer. title. Yeah. <laughs> You're doing dog's work. Hey. hey. <laughs> oh, thank you, Malky. I, I was, I'm relieved about that. The last time that I came on Beer Christianity and you called me big dog, then um the rest of the huge greenbelt staff team no i mean very small greenbelt staff team do actually call me that now thank you to you excellent, excellent. <laughs> as they should absolutely <laughs> keep doing it or i mean Malky's now called you a literal dog so now you know the gloves are off really oh, Malky is. is the architect of your next year's abuse i was trying to save him <laughs> <laughs> save yourself <laughs> anyway paul um is there anyone else? This is another nightmare question to be put on the spot. Um, who else uh, at Greenbelt should we not miss that we have not mentioned? Um, um, I think that um, Sophie Grace Chappelle, I don't know if you've come across her. Um, she's written a book called Transfigured, which is about her experience as a trans woman. Um when we invited her to speak, interestingly, she came straight back and said, I came to Greenbelt in the early 1980s and I mention it in one of the opening chapters of the book. And she sent me a screen grab of this little reference to being at a Greenbelt communion, I think in 1981. Um, I'm very much looking forward to her speaking. Um, I think she's very brave and uh, has written a beautiful book. Yeah. I think that, that she'd be one person I would name. Awesome. Also, I think we would um, be remiss for not saying that the number of times you've apologized for talking about Greenbelt <laughs> when, when you are literally on the podcast for being <laughs> the uh, large uh, canine of uh, <laughs> Greenbelt. <laughs> and also because you're a lovely man um <laughs> yeah the, you know that's fine <laughs> you're you're allowed to talk about your festival and big it up because we big it up when you're not on the show so i think it's only fair that that you get to do it occasionally just you know to our faces <laughs> and that's fine thank you paul thank you so much uh for coming on the show thank you so much to you and to everybody on the green belt team uh, who puts it together every year we end up having just such an incredible kind of um transfigurative is that the word transfiguring i don't know disfiguring no transfiguring <laughs> kind of experience of it it's uh you're, you're you're still doing god's work god is showing up in really interesting and cool ways and it just it's just a really cool space and yeah so thank you so much for doing that and thanks for coming on the show thank you Thank you so much. And at the risk of backslapping, we at Greenbelt look in on what you do at Beer Christianity, Beer Christianity and, and it's it's often like, you know, if we had the energy and the bandwidth to keep on being Greenbelt year round, um, we'd be, be we, we'd want to be like you. And we love the issues that you dig into that you will not let go of. And um, yeah, we just really wanted to say thank you for what you do. It's almost like... Um, you're an, an ember of the, the the little fire that we make once a year. It hopefully creates embers that go out. And I we we very much see a be, see beer Christianity as definitely one of those embers. But that's I don't want to sound patronising because you are you in your own right, and you always <laughs> oh. would have been. But uh, yeah, we love it. We love what you do. 
Seriously. Thank you very much. That's very kind. And we don't see it as patronizing at all. That's awesome. <laughs> Not at all. It's very sweet. <laughs> uh, thanks, everybody, for listening. Uh, you can catch more of us um, at beerchristianity.co.uk. You can also find us on Substack, Beer Christianity, the newsletter, where we do some written stuff every now and then. Uh, we're on Instagram. We're on Facebook. Um, you know, those sorts of things. So take a listen and Go to Greenbelt. Um, mm. Greenbelt. Wait, we haven't given them. Yeah, we haven't given everybody the the. We're assuming everybody knows the dates and the prices. Paul. Well, it's Why probably tomorrow. By the time <laughs> we get this edited and out, <laughs> like, go quick, get in the car. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The dates are Thursday, the twenty second of August, through inclusively to Sunday, the twenty fifth of August. Um, the August bank holiday weekend, Baron House near Kettering. Tickets are still on sale and will be up until Wednesday midnight, just before we um, start welcoming people onto site on the Thursday, the 22nd. Brilliant. So go and check that out. Try and make it to Greenbelt. Even if you can only come for a day, come for a day. It's so good. It's so good. And uh, thanks for listening. Goodbye. Bye. Bye.